Disclaimer. This book may contain content that is considered historically inaccurate or culturally insensitive by modern standards. My hope is that by exploring old literature, we will better understand why people of the past thought the way that they did and understand the influences that shaped their culture. This video is not intended for young audiences. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from Myths from Many Lands, and this is from, I believe, a series called The Children's Hour. This is the second book in, in the series. It was published by Houghton Mifflin Co. and it is from 1907. So under, uh, right, right now we're still in myths of Greece and, uh, myths of Greece and Rome. And today we will be reading The Dragon's Teeth by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Cadmus, Phoenix, and Celix the three sons of King Agenor and their little sister Europa, who was a very beautiful child, were at play together near the seashore in their father's kingdom of Phoenicia. They had rambled to some distance from the palace where their parents dwelt, and were now in a verdant meadow, on one side of which lay the sea, all sparkling and dimpling in the sunshine, and murmuring gently against the beach. The three boys were very happy, gathering flowers and twining them into garlands, with which they adorned the little Europa. Seated on the grass, the child was almost hidden under an abundance of buds and blossoms, whence her rosy face peeped merrily out, and, as Cadmus said, was the prettiest of all the flowers. Just then, there came a splendid butterfly fluttering along the meadow, and Cadmus, Phoenix, and Celix set off in pursuit of it, crying out that it was a flower with wings. Europa, who was a little wearied with playing all day long, did not chase the butterfly with her brothers, but sat still where they had left her and closed her eyes. For a while, she listened to the pleasant murmur of the sea, which was like a voice saying, Hush, and bidding her go to sleep. But the pretty child, if she slept at all, could not have slept more than a moment when she heard something trample on the grass not far from her, and peeping out from the heap of flowers beheld a snow-white bull. And whence could this bull have come? Europa and her brothers had been a long time playing in the meadow, and had seen no cattle nor other living thing, either there or on the neighboring hills. Brother Cadmus, cried Europa, starting up up out of the midst of the roses and lilies. Phoenix! Celix! Where are you all? Help! Help! Come and drive away this bull! But her brothers were too far off to hear, especially as the fright took away Europa's voice and hindered her from calling very loudly. So there she stood, with her pretty mouth wide open, as pale as the white lilies that were twisted among the other flowers in her garlands. Nevertheless, it was the suddenness with which she had perceived the bull, rather than anything frightful in his appearance, that caused Europa so much alarm. On looking at him more attentively, she began to see that he was a beautiful animal, and even fancied a particu particularly amiable expression in his face. As for his breath, the breath of cattle, you know, is always sweet. It was as fragrant as, he, as if he had been grazing on no other food than rosebuds or, at least, the most delicate of clover blossoms. Never before did a bull have such bright and tender eyes, and such smooth horns of ivory as this one, and the bull ran little races, and capered sportively around the child, so that she quite forgot how big and strong he was, and, from the gentleness and playfulness of his actions, soon came to consider him as innocent a creature as a pet lamb. Thus, frightened as she was at first, as she at first was, you might by and by have seen Europa stroking the bull's forehead with her small white hand and taking the garlands off her own head to hang them on his neck and ivory horns. Then she pulled up some blades of grass, and he ate them out of her hand, not as if he were hungry, but because he wanted to be friends with the child, and took pleasure in eating what she had touched. Well, my stars! Was there ever such a gentle, sweet, pretty, and amiable creature as this bull, and ever such a nice playmate for a little girl. And the animal saw, for the bull had so much intelligence that it, is, that it is really wonderful to think of, when he saw that Europa was no longer afraid of him, he grew overjoyed and could hardly contain himself for delight. He frisked about the meadows, now here, now there, making sprightly leaps, with as little 
effort as a bird expends in hopping from twig to twig. Indeed, his motion was as light as if he were flying through the air, and his hoofs seemed hardly to leave their print in the grassy soil over which he trod. With his spotless hue, he resembled a snowdrift, wafted along by the wind. Once he galloped so far away that Europa feared lest she might never see him again, so, setting up her childish voice, she called him back. Come back, pretty creature, she cried. Here is a nice clo clover blossom. And then it was delightful to witness the gratitude of this amiable bull, and how he was so full of joy and thankfulness that he capered higher than ever. He came running and bowed his head before Europa, as if he knew her to be a king's daughter, or else recognized the important truth that a little girl is everybody's queen. And not only did the bull bend his neck, he absolutely knelt down at her feet and made such intelligent nods and other inviting gestures that Europa understood what he meant just as well as if he had put it in so many words. Come, dear child, was what he wanted, wanted to say. Let me give you a ride on my back. At the first thought of such a thing, Europa drew back, but then she considered it considered in her wise little head that there could be no possible harm in taking just one gallop on the back of this docile and friendly animal, who would certainly set her down the very instant she desired it, and how it would surprise her brothers to see her riding across the green meadow, and what merry times they might have, either taking turns for a gallop, or clambering on the gentle creature, all four children together, and careering round the field with shouts of laughter that would be heard as far off as King Agenor's palace. I think I will do it, said the child to herself, and indeed, why not? She cast a glance around, and caught a glimpse of Cadmus, Phoenix, and Celix, who were still in pursuit of the butterfly, almost at the other end of the meadow. It would be the quickest way of rejo rejoining them to get upon this to get upon this white bull's back. She came a step nearer to him, therefore, and sociable creature that he was, he showed so much joy at this mark of her confidence that the child could not find it in her heart to hesitate any longer, making one bound for this little princess was as active as as a squirrel. There sat Europa on the beautiful bull holding an ivory horn in each hand, lest she should fall off. Softly, pretty bull, softly, she said, rather frightened at what she had done. Do not gallop too fast. Having got the child on his back, the animal gave a leap into the air and came down so like a feather that Europa did not know when his hoofs touched the ground. He then began a race to that part of the flowery plain where her three brothers were, and where they had just caught their splendid butterfly. Europa screamed with delight, and Phoenix, Celix, and Cadmus stood gaping at the spectacle of their sister mounted on a white bull, not knowing whether to be frightened or to, to wish the same good luck for themselves. The gentle and innocent creature, for who could possibly doubt that he was so, pranced round among the children as sportively as a kitten. Europa all the while looked down upon her brothers, nodding and laughing, but yet with a sort of stateliness in her rosy little face. As the bull wheeled about to take another gallop across the meadow, the child waved her hand and said, Goodbye, playfully pretending that she was now bound on a distant journey and might not see her brothers again, for nobody could tell how long. Goodbye, shouted Cadmus, Phoenix, and Celix, all in one breath. But, together with her enjoyment of the sport, there was still a little remnant of fear in the child's heart, so that her last, book, her last look at the three boys was a troubled one, and made them feel as if their dear sister were really leaving them forever. And what do you think the snowy bull did next? Why, he set off, as swift as the wind, straight down to the seashore, scampered across the sand, took an airy leap, and plunged right in among the flo foaming billows. The white spray rose in a shower over him and the little Europa, and fell spattering down upon the water. Then what a scream of terror did the poor child send forth. The three brothers screamed manfully, likewise, and ran to the shore as fast as their legs would carry them, with Cadmus at their head. But it was too late. 
when they reached the margin of, of the sand, the treacherous animal was already far away in the wide blue sea, with only his snowy head and tail emerging, and poor little Europa between them, stretching out one hand towards her dear brothers, while she grasped the bull's ivory horn with the other. And there stood Cadmus, Phoenix, and Celix, gazing at this sad spectacle through their tears, until they could no longer distinguish the bull's snowy head from the white-capped billows that seemed to boil up out of the sea's depths around him. Nothing more was ever seen of the white bull, nothing more of the beautiful child. This was a mournful story, as you may well think, for the three boys to carry home to their parents. King Agnor, their father, was the ruler of the whole country, but he loved his little daughter Europa better than his kingdom, or than all his other children, or than anything else in the world. Therefore, when Cadmus and his two brothers came crying home, and told him how that a white bull had carried off their sister, and swam with her over the sea, the king was quite beside himself with grief and rage. Although it was now twilight, and fast growing dark, he bade them set out instantly in search of her. "'Never shall you see my face again,' he cried, "'unless you bring me back my little Europa "'to gladden me with her smiles and her pretty ways. "'Be gone, and enter my presence no more, "'till you come leading her by the hand.' "'As King Agnor said this, his eyes flashed fire, "'for he was a very passionate king, "'and he looked so terribly angry "'that the poor boys did not even venture to ask for their suppers, "'but slunk away out of the palace.' and only paused on the steps a moment to consult whither they should go first. While they were standing there, all in dismay, their mother, Queen Telephassa, who happened not to be by when they told the story to the king, came hurrying after them, and said that she too would go in quest of her daughter. "'Oh, no, mother,' cried the boys, "'the night is dark, and there is no knowing what troubles and perils we may meet with.' "'Alas, my dear children,' answered poor Queen Telephassa, weeping bitterly. That is only another reason why I should go with you. If I should lose you too, as well as my little Europa, what would become of me? And let me go like and let me go likewise, said their playfellow Thassus, who came running to join them. Thassus was the son of a seafaring person in the neighborhood. He had been brought up with the young princes, and was their intimate friend, and loved Europa very much, so they consented that he should accompany them. The whole party, therefore, set forth together. Cadmus, Phoenix, Celix, and Thassus clus clustered round Queen Telephassa, grasping her skirts and begging her to lean upon their shoulders whenever she felt weary. In this manner they went down the palace steps and began a journey which turned out to be a great deal longer than they dreamed of. The last that they saw of King Agnor, he came to the door, with a servant holding a torch beside him, and called after them in the, into the, the gathering darkness, Remember, never ascend these steps again without the child! Never, sobbed Queen Telephassa, and the three brothers and Thassus answered, Never, 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 never. And they kept their word. Year after year, King Agnor sat in the solitude of his beautiful palace, listening in vain for the returning footsteps, hoping to hear the familiar voice of the queen and the cheerful talk of his sons and their playfellow Thassus, entering the door together, and the sweet, childish accents of little Europa in the midst of them. But so long a time went by that, at last, if they had really come, the king would not have known that this that this was the voice of Telephassa, and these the younger voices that used that used to make such joyful echoes when the children were playing about the palace. We must now leave King Agnor to sit on his throne, and must go along with Queen Telephassa and her four youthful companions. They went on and on, and traveled a long way, and passed over mountains and rivers, and sailed over seas. Here and there and everywhere they made continual inquiry if any person could tell them what had become of Europa. The rustic people, of whom they asked this question, paused a little while from their labors in the field and looked very much surprised. They thought it strange to behold a woman in the garb of a queen, for Telephassa, in her haste, had forgotten to take off her crown and her royal robes, roaming about the country with four lads ar around her on such an errand as this seemed to be. 
but nobody could give them any tidings of Europa. Nobody had seen a little girl dressed like a princess, and mounted on a snow-white bowl, which galloped as swiftly as the wind. I cannot tell you how long Queen Telephassa, and Cadmus, and Phoenix, and Silas, her three sons, and Thassus, their playfellow, went wandering along the highways and bypaths, or through the pathless wilderness of the earth, in this manner, but certain it is that, before they reached any place of rest, their splendid garments were quite worn out. They all looked very much travel-stained, and would have had the would have had the dust of many countries on their shoes if the streams through which they waded had not washed it all away when they had been gone a year telephassa threw away her crown because it chafed her forehead it has given me many a headache said the poor queen and it cannot cure my heartache as fast as their princely robes got torn and tattered they exchanged them for such for such mean attire as ordinary people wore by and by they came to have a wild and homeless aspect, so that you would much sooner have taken them for a gypsy family than a queen and three princes, and a young nobleman, who had once a palace for their home, and a train of servants to, to do their bidding. The four boys grew up to be tall young men, with sunburnt faces, each of them girded on a sword, to defend themselves against the perils of the way. When the husbandmen, at whose farmhouses they sought hospitality, needed their assistance in the harvest field, they gave it willingly. And Queen Telephassa, who had done no work in her palace, save to braid silk threads with golden ones, came behind them to bind the sheaves. If payment was offered, they shook their heads and only asked for tidings of Europa. "'There are bowls enough in my pasture,' the old farmers would reply. "'But I never heard of one like this you, you tell me of.' A snow-white bowl with a little princess on his back. Oh, oh, I ask your pardon, good folks, but there never was such a sight seen hereabouts. At last, when his, when his upper lip began to have the down on it, Phoenix grew weary of rambling hither and thither to no purpose. So, one day, when they happened to be passing through a pleasant and solitary tract of country, he sat himself down on a heap of moss. I can go no farther, said Phoenix. It is a mere foolish waste of life to spend it, as we do, and always wandering up and down, and never coming to any home at nightfall. Our sister is lost, and never will be found. She probably perished in the sea, or to whatever shore the white bull may have carried her. It is now so many years ago, that there would be neither love nor acquaintance between us should we meet again. My father has forbidden us to return to his palace, so I shall build me a hut of branches, and dwell here. Well, son Phoenix, said Telephassa, sorrowfully, you have grown to be a man, and must do as you judge best. But, for my part, I will still go in quest of my poor child. And we three will go along with you, cried Cadmus and Celix and their faithful friend Thassus. But, before setting out, they all helped Phoenix to build a habitation. When completed, it was a sweet rural bower, roofed overhead with an arch of living bows. Inside there were two pleasant rooms, one of which had a soft heap of moss for a bed, while the other was furnished with a rustic seat or two, curiously fashioned out of the crooked roots of trees. So comfortable and homelike did it seem, that Telephassa and her three companions could not help sighing, to think that they must still roam about the world, instead of spending the remainder of their lives in some ch such cheerful abode as they had here built for Phoenix. But when they bade him farewell, Phoenix shed tears, and probably regretted that he was no longer to keep them company. However, he had fixed upon an admirable place to dwell in, and by and by there came other people who chanced to have no homes, and, seeing how pleasant a spot it was, they built themselves huts in the neighborhood of Phoenix's habitation. Thus, before many years went by, a city had grown up there, in the center of which was seen a stately palace of marble, wherein dwelt Phoenix, clothed in a purple robe, and wearing a golden crown upon his head. For the inhabitants of the new city, finding that he had royal blood in his veins, had chosen him to be their king. The very first degree of state which King Phoenix issued was that if a maiden happened to arrive in the kingdom, mounted on a snow-white bowl, and calling herself Europa, his subjects should treat her with the greatest kindness and respect, and immediately bring her to the palace. You may see by this that Phoenix's conscience never quite ceased to trouble him for giving up the quest of his dear sister, and sitting himself down to be comfortable, while his mother and her companions went onward. 
But, af but often and often, at the close of a weary day's journey, the Telephassa and Cadmus, Celix, and Thassus remember the pleasant spot in which they had left Phoenix. It was a sorrowful prospect for these wanderers, that on the morrow they must again set forth, and that, after many nightfalls, they would perhaps no be no, no nearer the close of their toilsome pilgrimage than now. These thoughts made them all melancholy at times, but appeared to torment Celix more than the rest of the party. At length, one morning, when they were t taking their staffs in hand to set out, he thus addressed them. My dear mother, and you, good brother Cadmus, and my friend Thassus, methinks we are like people in a dream. There is no substance in the life which we are leading. It is such a dreary length of time since the white bull carried off my sister Europa that I have quite forgotten how she looked, and the tones of her voice, and indeed, almost doubt whether such a little girl ever lived in the world, and whether she once lived or no, I am convinced that she no longer survives, and that therefore it, it, it is the merest folly to waste our own lives and happiness in seeking her. Where were we to find her, she would now be a woman grown, and would look upon us, upon us all as strangers. So, to tell you the truth, I have resolved to take up my abode here, and I entreat you, mother, brother, and friend, to follow my example. Not I, for one, said Telephassa, although the poor queen, firmly as she spoke, was so travel-worn that she could hardly put her foot, put her foot to the ground. Not I, for one. In the depths of my heart, little Europa is still the rosy child who ran to gather flowers so many years ago. She has not grown to womanhood, nor forgotten me. At noon, at night, journeying onward, sitting down to rest, her childish voice is always in my ears, calling, Mother! Mother! Stop here who may. There is no repose for me. Nor for me, said Cadmus, while my dear mother pleases to go onward. And the faithful Thassus, too, was resolved to bear to bear them company. They remained with Celix a day, a few days, however, and helped him to build a rustic bower resembling the one which they had formerly built for Phoenix. When they were bidding him farewell, Celix burst into tears and told his mother that it seemed just as melancholy a dream to stay there in solitude as to go onward. If she really believed that they would ever find Europa, he was willing to continue the search with them even now. But Telephassa bade him remain there and be happy if his own heart would let him. So the pilgrims took their leave of him and departed, and were hardly out of sight before some other wandering people came along the way and saw Celix's habitation and were greatly delighted with the appearance of the place. There being abundance of unoccup unoccupied ground in the neighborhood, these strangers built huts for themselves and were soon joined by a multitude of new settlers who quickly formed a city. In the middle of it was a scene, a magnificent palace of colored marble, on the balcony, the balcony of which, every noontide, appeared Celix in a long purple robe, and with a jeweled crown upon his head, for the inhabitants, when they found out he, that he was a king's son, had considered him the fittest of all men to be a, to be a king himself. One of the first acts of which King Celix's government was to send out an expedition consisting of a grave ambassador and an escort of bold and hardy young men with orders to visit the principal kingdoms of the earth and inquire whether a young maiden had passed through those regions galloping swiftly on a white bull. It is, therefore, plain to mind that Celix secretly blamed himself for giving up the search for Europa as long as he was able to put one foot before the other. As for Telephassa and Cadmus and the good Thassus, it grieves me to think of them, still keeping up that weary pilgrimage. The two young men did their best for the poor queen, helping her over the rough places, often carrying her across rivulets in their faithful arms, and seeking to shelter at her at nightfall, even when they themselves lay on the ground. Sad, sad it was to hear them asking of every passerby if he had seen Europa, so long after the white bull had carried her away. But, though, though the, gray, the gray years thrust themselves between, and made the child's figure dim in their remembrance, neither of these true-hearted three ever dreamed of giving up the search. One morning, however, poor Thassus found that he had sprained his ankle, and could not possibly go a, a step farther. After a few days, to be sure, said he mournfully, I might make shift to hobble along with a stick, 
but that would only delay you, and perhaps hinder you from finding a dear little Europa, after all your pains and trouble. Do you go forward, therefore, my beloved companions, and leave me to follow as I may. Thou hast been a true friend, dear Thassus, said Queen Telephassa, kissing his forehead, being neither my son nor the brother of our lost Europa. Thou hast shown thyself truer to me and her than Phoenix and Silex, Silex did, whom we have left behind us. Without thy loving help and that of my son Cadmus, my limbs could not have borne me half so far as this. Now take thy rest and be at peace, for, and it is the first time I have owned it to myself, I begin to question whether we shall ever find my beloved daughter in this world. Saying this, the poor queen shed tears, because it was a grievous trial to the mother's heart to confess that her hopes were growing faint. From that day forward, Cadmus noticed that she never traveled with the same alacrity of spirit that had heretofore supported her. Her weight was heavier upon his arm. Before setting out, Cadmus helped Thassus build a, a bower, while Telephassa, being too infirm to give any great assistance, advised them how to fit it up and furnish it, so that it might be as comfortable as a hut of branches could. Thassus, however, did not spend all his days in this green bower, for it happened to him, as to Phoenix and Celix, that other homeless people visited the spot and liked it, and built themselves habitations in the neighborhood. So here, in the course of a few years, was another thriving city with a red freestone palace in the center of it, where Thassus sat upon a throne, doing justice to the people, with a purple robe over his shoulders, a scepter in his hand, and a crown upon his head. The inhabitants had made him king, not for the sake of any royal blood, for none was in his veins, but because Thassus was an upright, true-hearted, and courageous man, and therefore fit to rule. But when the affairs of his kingdom were all settled, the king Thassus laid aside his purple robe and crown and scepter and bade, the wor bade his worthiest subject distribute justice to the people in, the in his stead. Then, grasping the pilgrim staff that had supported him so long, he set forth again, hoping still to discover some hoof mark of the snow-white bull, some trace of the vanished child. He returned after a lengthened absence and sat down wearily upon his throne. To his latest hour, nevertheless, King Thassus showed his, his true-hearted remembrance of Europa by ordering that a fire should always be kept burning in his palace, and a bath steaming hot, and food ready to be served and food ready to be served up, and a bed with snow-white snow sheets, in case the maiden should arrive, and require immediate refreshment. And though Europa never came, the good Thassus had the blessings of many a poor traveller, who profited by the food and lodging which were meant for the little playmate of the king's boyhood. Telephassa and Cadmus were now pursuing their we weary way, with no companion but each other. The queen leaned heavily upon her th son's arm, and could walk only a few miles a day, but for all her weakness and weariness, she would not be persuaded to give up the search. It was enough to bring tears in the eyes of, a of bearded of bearded men to hear the melancholy tone with which she inquired of every stranger whether he could tell her any news of the lost child. Have you seen a little girl? No, no, I mean a young maiden of full growth, passing by this way, mounted on a snow-white bull, which gallops as swiftly as the wind. We have seen no such wondrous sight, the people would reply, and very often, taking Cadmus's Cadmus aside, they whispered to him, Is this stately and sad-looking woman your mother? Surely she is not in her right mind, and you ought to take her home, and make her comfortable, and do your best to get this dream out of her fancy. It is no dream, said Cadmus. Everything else is a dream, save that. But one day, Telephassa seemed feebler than usual, and leaned almost her whole weight on the arm of Cadmus, and walked more slowly than ever before. At last they reached a solitary spot, where she told her son that she must needs lie down and take a good, long rest. A good, long rest, she repeated, looking Cadmus tenderly in the face. A good, long rest, thou dearest one. As long as you please, dear mother, answered Cadmus. Telephassa bade him sit down on the turf beside her, and then she, she took his hand. My son, 
said she, fixing her dim eyes most lovingly upon him. This rest that I speak of will be very long indeed. You must not wait till it is finished. Dear Cadmus, you do not comprehend me. You must make a grave here and lay your mother's weary frame into it. My pilgrimage is over. Cadmus burst into tears, and for a long time refused to believe that his dear mother was now to be taken from him. But Telephassa reasoned with him, and kissed him, and at length made him discern that it was better for her spirit to pass away out of the toil, the weariness, the grief, and disappointment which had burdened her on earth ever since the child was lost. He therefore repressed his sorrow, and listened to her last words. Dearest Cadmus, said she, thou hast been the truest son that ever mother had, and faithful to the very last. Who else would have borne with my infirmities as thou hast? It is owing to thy care, thou tenderest child, that my grave was not dug long years ago, in some valley or on some hillside that lies far, far behind us. It is enough. Thou shalt wander no more on this hopeless search, but when thou hast laid thy mother in the earth, then go, my son, to Delphi, and inquire of the oracle what thou shalt do next. Oh, mother, mother, cried Cadmus, couldst thou but have seen my sister before this hour? It matters little now, answered Telephassa, and there was a smile upon her face. I go now to the better world, and, sooner or later, shall find my daughter there. I will not sadden you, my little hearers, with telling how Telephassa died and was buried, but will only say that her dying smile grew brighter instead of vanishing from her dead face, so that Cadmus felt convinced that, at her very first step into the better world, she had caught Europa in her arms. He planted some flowers on his mother's grave, and left them to grow there, and make the place beautiful when he should be far away. After performing this last sor sorrowful duty, he set forth alone, and took the road towards the famous oracle of Delphi, as Telephassa had advised him. On his way thither, he still inquired of most people whom he met whether they had seen Europa, for, to say the truth, Cadmus had grown so accustomed to ask the question that it came to his lips as readily as a remark about the weather. He received various answers. Some told him one thing, and some another. M among the rest, a mariner affirmed that, many years before, in a distant country, he had heard a rumor about a white bull, which came swimming across the sea with a child on his back, dressed up in flowers that were blighted by the sea water. He did not know what had become of the child or the bull, and Cadmus suspected, indeed, by a queer twinkle in the mar mariner's eyes, that he was putting a joke upon him, and had never really heard anything about the matter. Poor Cadmus found it more wearisome to travel alone than to bear all his dear mother's weight while she had kept him company. His heart, you will understand, was now so heavy that it seemed impossible, sometimes, to carry it any farther. But his limbs were strong and active, and well accustomed to exercise. He walked swiftly along, thinking of King Agnor and Queen Telephassa, and his brothers, and the friendly Thassus, all of whom he had left behind at one point of his pilgrimage or another, and never expected to see them any more. Full of these remembrances, he came within sight of a, loft, of a lofty mountain, which the people thereabouts told him was called Parnassus. On the slope of Mount Parnassus was the famous Delphi, whither Cadmus was going. This Delphi was supposed to be the very midmost spot on the whole world. The place of the oracle was a certain cavity in the mountainside, over which, when Cadmus came thither, he found a rude bower of branches. It reminded him of those which he had helped to build for Phoenix and Celix, and afterwards for Thassus. In latter times, when multitudes of people came from great distances to put questions to the oracle, a spacious temple of marble was erected over the spot. But in the days of Cadmus, as I have told you, there was only this rustic bower, with its abundance of green foliage and a tuft of shrubbery that ran wild over the mysterious hole in the hillside. When Cadmus had 
thrust a passage through the tangled boughs and made his way into the bower. He did not at first discern the half-hidden cavity, but soon he felt a cold stream of air rushing out of it with so much force that it shook the ringlets on his cheek. Pulling away the shrubbery which clustered over the hole, he bent forward and spoke in a distinct but reverential tone, as if addressing some unseen personage inside of the mountain. Sacred Oracle of Delphi, said he, whither shall I go next in quest of my dear sister Europa? There was, fir there was at first a deep silence, and then a rushing sound, or a noise like a long sigh, proceeding out of the interior of the earth. This cavity, you must know, was looked upon as a sort of fountain of truth, which sometimes gushed out in audible words, although, for the most part, these words were such a riddle that they might just as well have stayed at the bottom of the hole. But Cadmus was more fortunate than many others who went to Delphi in search of truth. By and by, the rushing noise began to sound like articulate language. It repeated over and over again the following sentence, which, after all, was so like the vague whistle of a blast of air that Cadmus really did not, know, did not quite know whether it meant anything or not. Seek her no more, seek her no more, seek her no more. What then shall I do? asked Cadmus, for ever since he was a child, you know, it had been the great object of his life to find his sister. From the very hour that he left following the butterfly in the meadow, near his father's palace, he had done his best to follow Europa over land and sea. And now, if he must give up the search, he seemed to have no more business in the world. But again, the sighing gust of air grew into something like a hoarse voice. Follow the cow, it said. Follow the cow. Follow the cow. And when these words had been repeated until Cadmus was tired of hearing them, especially as he could not imagine what cow it was, or why he was to follow her, the gusty hole gave vent to another sentence. Where the stray cow lies down, there is your home. These words were pronounced but a single time, and died away into a whisper before Cadmus was fully satisfied that he had caught the meaning. He put other questions, but received no answer. Only the gust of wind sighed continually out of the cavity, and blew the withered leaves rustling along the ground before it. Did there really come any words out of the hole, thought Cadmus, or have I been dreaming all this while? He turned away from the oracle, and thought himself no wiser than he, when he came thither. Caring little what might happen to him, he took the first path that offered itself, and went along at a sluggish pace, for, having no object in view, nor any reason to go one way more than another, it would certainly have been foolish to make haste. Whenever he met anybody, the old question was at his tongue's end. Have you seen a beautiful maiden, dressed like a king's daughter, and mounted on a snow-white bowl that gallops as swiftly as the wind? But, remembering what the oracle had said, he only half uttered the words, and then mumbled the rest indistinctly, and from his confusion, people must have imagined that this handsome young man has, had lost his wits. I know not how far Cadmus had gone, nor could he himself have told you, when, at no great distance before him, he beheld a brindled cow. She was, she was lying down by the wayside and quietly chewing her cud, nor did she take any notice of the young man until he had approached pretty nigh. Then, getting leisurely upon her feet and giving her head a gentle toss, she began to move along at a moderate pace, often pausing just long enough to crop a mouthful of grass. Cadmus loitered behind, whistling idly to himself and scarcely noticing the cow, until the thought occurred to him whether this could possibly be the animal which, according to the oracle's response, was to serve him for a guide. That he smiled at himself for fancying such a thing. He could not seriously think that this was the cow, because she went along so quietly, behaving just like any other cow. Evidently, she neither knew nor cared so much as a wisp of hay about Cadmus, and was only thinking how to get her living along the wayside where the herbage where the herbage was green and fresh. Perhaps she was going home to be milked. Cow, cow, cow! cried Cadmus. Hey, Brindle, hey! Stop, my good cow! 
he wanted to come up with the cow so as to examine her and see if she would appear to know him or whether there were any peculiarities to distinguish her from a thousand other cows whose only business business it is whose only business is to fill the milk pail and sometimes kick it over but still the brindled cow trudged on whisking her tail to keep the flies away and taking as little notice of cadmus as she well could if he walked slowly so did the cow and seized the opportunity to graze if he quickened his pace the cow went just so much the faster and once when cadmus tried to catch her by running she threw out her heels stuck her tail straight on end and set off at a gallop looking as queerly as cows generally do while putting themselves to their speed when cadmus saw that it was impossible to come up with her he walked on moderately as before the cow too went leisurely on without looking behind wherever the grass was greenest there she nibbled a mouthful or nibbled a mouthful or two where a brook listened brightly across the path where the cow drank and breathed a com there the cow drank and breathed a comfortable sigh and drank again and trudged onward at the pace that best suited herself and cadmus i do believe thought cadmus that this may be the cow that was foretold me if it be the one, I suppose she will lie down somewhere somewhere hereabouts. Whether it were the oracular cow or some other one, it did not seem reasonable that she should travel a great way farther. So, whenever they reached a particularly pleasant spot on a breezy hillside, or in a sheltered vale, or flowery meadow on the shore of a calm lake, or along the bank of this bank of a clear stream, Cadmus looked eagerly around to see if the situation would suit him for a home. But still, whether he liked the place or no, the brindled cow never offered to lie down. On she, on she went at the quiet pace of a cow going homeward to the barnyard, and every moment Cadmus expected to see a milkmaid approaching with a pail, or a herdsman running to heed the, heed the, head the stray animal, and turn her back towards the pasture. But no milkmaid came, no herdsman drove her back, and Cadmus followed the stray brindle till he till he was almost ready to drop with fatigue oh brindled cow cried he in a tone of despair do you never mean to stop he had now grown too intent on following her to think of lagging behind however long the way and whatever might be his fatigue indeed it seemed as if there were something about the animal that bewitched people several persons who happened to see the brindled cow and cadmus following behind began to trudge, af trudge after her precisely as he did cadmus was glad of somebody to converse with and therefore talked very freely to these good people he told them all his adventures and how he had left king Ag agnor in his palace and phoenix at one place and celix at another and thasus at a third and his dear mother queen telephassa under a flowery sod so that now he was quite alone both friendless and homeless he mentioned likewise that the oracle had bidden him be guided by a cow and inquired of strangers whether they supposed that this brindled animal could be the one why it is a very wonderful affair answered one of his companions i am pretty well acquainted with the ways of cattle and i never knew a cow of her own accord to go so far without stopping if my legs will let me i'll never leave i'll never leave following the beast till she lies down nor i said a second nor i cried a third if she goes a hundred miles farther i'm determined to see the end of it the secret of it the secret of it was you must know that the cow was an enchanted cow and that without their being conscious of it she threw some of her enchantment over everybody that took so much as half a dozen steps behind her they could not possibly help following her though all the time they fancied themselves doing it of their own accord the cow was by no means very nice in choosing her path so that sometimes they had to scramble over rocks or wade through mud and mire and were all in a terror in a terribly bedraggled condition and tired to death and very hungry into the bargain what a weary business it was but still they kept trudging stoutly forward and talking as they and talking as they went the strangers grew very fond of cadmus and resolved never to leave him but to help him build a city wherever the cow might lie down 
In the center of it there should be a noble palace, in which Cadmus might dwell and be their king, with a throne, a crown and scepter, a purple robe, and everything else that a king ought to have. For in him there was the royal blood, and the royal heart, and the head that knew how to rule. While they were talking of these of these schemes, and beguiling the tediousness of the way with laying out the plan of the new city, one of the company happened to look at the cow. Joy, joy, cried he, clapping his hands. Brindle is going to lie down. They all looked, and sure enough, the cow had stopped and was staring leisurely about her, as other cows do when on the point of lying down. And slowly, slowly did she recline herself on the soft grass, first bending her, first bending her forelegs, and then crouching her hind ones. When Cadmus and his companions came up with her, there was the brindled cow taking her ease, chewing her cud, and looking them quietly in the face, as if this was just the spot she had been seeking for, and as if it, and as if it were all a matter of course. This, then, said Cadmus, gazing around him, this is to be my home. It was a fertile and lovely plain, with great trees flinging their sun-speckled shadows over it, and hills fencing it in from the rough weather. At no great distance, they beheld a river gleaming in the sunshine. A home feeling, a home feeling stole into the heart of poor Cadmus. He was very glad to know that there, that here he might awake in the morning without the necessity of putting on his dusty sandals to travel farther and farther. The days and the years would pass over him and find him still in this pleasant spot. If he could have had his brothers with him and his friend Thassus and could have seen his dear mother under a roof of his own, he might here have been happy after all their disappointments. Some day or other, too, his sister Europa might have come quietly to the door of his home and smiled round upon the familiar faces. But, indeed, since there was no hope of regaining the friends of his boyhood, or ever seeing his dear sister again, Cadmus resolved to make himself happy with these new companions, who had grown so fond of him while following the cow. Yes, my friends, said he to them, this is to be our home. Here we will build our habitations. The brindled cow, which has led us hither, will supply us with milk. We will cultivate the neighboring soil and lead an innocent and happy life. His companions joyfully assented to this plan, and, in the first place, being very hungry and thirsty, they looked about them for the means of providing a comfortable meal. Not far off, they saw a tuft of trees, which appeared as if there, there might be a spring of water beneath them. They went thither to fetch some, leaving Cadmus stretched on the ground along with the brindled cow. For, now that he had found a place of rest, it seemed as if all the weariness of his pilgrimage, ever since he left King Agnor's palace, had fallen upon him at once. But his new friends had not long been gone, when he was suddenly startled by cries, shouts, and screams, and the noise of a terrible struggle, and in the midst of it all, a most awful hissing, which went right through his ears like a rough saw. Running towards the tuft of trees, he beheld the head and fiery eyes of an immense serpent or dragon with the widest jaws that ever a dragon had and a vast many rows of horribly sharp teeth. Before Cadmus could reach the spot, this pitiless reptile had killed his poor companions and was busily devouring them, making but a mouthful of each man. It appears that the fountain of water was enchanted, and that the dragon had been set to guard it, so that no mortal might ever quench his thirst there. As the neighboring inhabitants carefully avoided the spot, it was now a long time, not less than a hundred years or thereabouts, since the monster had broken his fast, and, as was natural enough, his appetite had grown to be enormous, and was not half satisfied by the poor people whom he had just eaten up. When he caught sight of Cadmus, therefore, he set up another abominable hiss and flung back his immense jaws until his mouth looked like a great red cavern, at the farther end of which were seen the legs of his last victim, who he, who, whom he had hardly had time to swallow. But Cadmus was so enraged at the destruction of his friends that he cared neither for the size of the dragon's jaws nor for his hundreds of sharp teeth. 
Drawing his sword, he rushed at the monster and flung himself right into his cavernous mouth. The, this bold method, method of attacking him took the dragon by surprise, for, in fact, Cadmus had leapt so far down into his throat that the rows of terrible teeth could not close upon him, nor do him the least harm in the world. Thus, though the struggle was a tremendous one, and though the dragon shattered the tufts of trees into small splinters by lashing out his by the lashing of his tail. Yet, as Cadmus was all the while slashing and stabbing at his very vitals, it was not long before the scaly wretch bethought himself of slipping of slipping away. He had not gone he had not gone his length, however, when the brave Cadmus gave him a sword thrust that finished the battle. And creeping out of the gateway of the creature's jaws, there he beheld him still wriggling his vast bulk. Here he beheld him still wriggling his vast bulk, although there was no longer life enough in him to harm a little child. But do not you suppose that it made Cadmus sorrowful to think of the melancholy fate which had befallen those poor, friendly people who had followed the cow along with him? It seemed as if he were doomed to lose everybody whom he loved, or to see them perish in one way or another. And here he was, after all his toils and troubles, in a solitary place, with not a single human being to help to help him build a hut. What shall I do? cried he aloud. It were it were better for me to have been devoured by the dragon, as my poor companions were. Cadmus, said a voice, but whether it came from above or below him, or whether it spoke within his own breast, the young man could not tell. Cadmus, Pluck out the dragon's teeth and plant them in the, in the earth. This was a strange thing to do, nor was it very easy, I should imagine, to dig out all those deep-rooted fangs from the dragon from the dead dragon's jaws. But Cadmus toiled and tugged, and after pounding the monstrous head almost to pieces with a great stone, he at last collected as many teeth as might have filled a bushel or two. The next thing was to plant them. This, likewise, was a tedious piece of work, especially as Cadmus was already exhausted, exhausted with killing the dragon, knocking his head to pieces, and had nothing to dig the earth with that I know of unless it were his sword blade. Finally, however, a sufficiently large tract of ground was turned up and sown with this new kind of seed, although half of the dragon's teeth still remained to be planted some other day. Cadmus, quite out of breath, stood leaning upon his sword and wondering what was to happen next. He had waited but a few moments when he began to see a sight which was as great a marvel as the most marvelous thing I ever told you about. The sun was shining slantwise over the field and showed all the, mo all the moist, dark soil just like any other newly planted piece of ground. All at once, Cadmus fancied he saw something glisten very brightly, first at one spot, then at another, and then at a hundred and a thousand spots together. Soon he perceived them to be the steel, ha steel heads of spears, sprouting up everywhere like so many stalks of grain, and continually growing taller and taller. Next appeared a vast number of bright sword blades, thrusting themselves up in the same way. A moment afterwards, the whole surface of the ground was broken up by a multitude of polished brass helmets, coming up like a crop of enormous beans. So rapidly did they grow, that Cadmus now discerned the fierce countenance of a man beneath every one. In short, before he had time to think about think what a wonderful affair it was he beheld an abundant harvest of what looked like human beings armed with helmets and breastplates shields swords and spears and before they were well out of the earth they brandished their weapons and clashed them one against another seeming to think little wi little while as little while as they had yet lived that they had wasted too much of life without a battle every tooth of the drake and the dragon had produced one of these sons of deadly mischief. Up sprouted also a great many trumpeters, and with the first breath that they drew, they put their brazen trumpets to the to their lips, and sounded sounded a tremendous and ear-shattering blast, so that the whole space, 
just now so quiet and solitary, reverberated with the clash and clang of arms, the bray of warlike music, and the shouts of angry men. So enraged did they look, so enraged did they all look, that Cadmus fully expected them to put the whole world to the sword. How fortunate would it be for a great conqueror if he could get a bushel of the dragon's teeth to sow? Cadmus, said the same voice which he had before heard, threw a stone into the midst of the armed men. So Cadmus seized a large stone, and, flinging it into the middle of the earth, of the earth army, saw it strike the breastplate of a gigantic and fierce-looking warrior. Immediately on failing the blow, he seemed to take it for granted that, that somebody had struck him, and, uplifting his weapon, he smote his next neighbor a blow that cleft his helmet asunder and stretched him on the ground. In an instant, those nearest the fallen warrior began to strike at one another with their swords and stab with their spears. The confusion spread wider and wider. Each man smote down his brother, and was himself smitten down before he had time to exult in his victory. The trumpeters, all the while, blew their blasts shriller and shriller. Each soldier shouted a battle cry, and often fell with it on his lips. It was the strangest spectacle of causeless wrath and of mischief for no good end that had ever been witnessed. But after all, it was neither more foolish it was neither more foolish nor more wicked than a thousand battles that have since been fought, in which men have slain their brothers with just as little reason as these children of the dragon's teeth. It ought to be considered, too, that the dragon people were made for nothing else, whereas mortal whereas other mortals were born to love and help one another. Well, this memorable battle continued to rage until the ground was strewn with helmeted heads that had been cut off. Of all the thousands that had begun, began the fight, there were only five left standing. These now rushed from different parts of the field, and meeting in the middle of it, clashed their swords and struck at each other's hearts as fiercely as ever. Cadmus, said the voice again, but those five warriors sheathe their swords. They will help you to build the city. Without hesitating an instant, Cadmus stepped forward with the aspect of a king and a leader, and extending his drawn sword among th amongst them, spoke to the warriors in a stern and commanding voice. Sheathe your weapons, said he, and forthwith, feeling themselves bound to obey him, the five remaining sons of the dragon's teeth made him a military salute with their swords, returned them to the scabbard, to the scabbards, and stood before Cadmus in a rank, eyeing him as soldiers eye their captain, while awaiting the word of command. These five men had probably sprung from the biggest of the dragon's teeth, and were the boldest and strongest of the whole army. They were almost giants, indeed, and had good need to be so, else they never could have lived through so terrible a fight. They still had a very furious look, and, if Cadmus happened to glance aside, would glare at one another, with, with fire flashing out of their eyes. It was strange, too, to observe how the earth out of, out of which they had so lately grown out of which they had so lately grown was encrusted here on here and there on their bright breastplates and even begrimed their faces, just as you may have seen it clinging to the beets to beets and carrots when pulled out of their native soil. Cadmus hardly knew whether to consider them as men or some odd kind of vegetable. Although, on the whole, he concluded that there was human nature in them, because they were so fond of trumpets and weapons, and so ready to shed blood. They looked him earnestly in the face, waiting for his next order, and evidently desiring no other employment than to follow him from one battlefield to another, all over the wide world. But Cadmus was wiser than these earth-born creatures, with the dragon's fierceness in them, and knew better how to use their strength and hardiness. Come, said he, you are sturdy fellows. Make yourselves useful. Quarry some stones with these great swords of yours, and help me to build a city. The five soldiers grumbled a little, and muttered that it was their business to overthrow cities, not to build them up. But Cadmus looked at them with a stern eye, and spoke to them in a tone of authority, so that they knew him for their master, and never again thought of disobeying his commands. They set, them, they set to work in good earnest, and toiled so diligently, that, in a very short time, a city began to make its appearance, 
At first, to be sure, the workmen showed a quarrelsome disposition. Like savage beasts, they would doubtless have done they would doubtless have done one another a mischief if Cadmus had not kept watch over them and quelled the fierce old serpent that lurked in their hearts when he saw it gleaming out of their wild eyes. But in course of time, they got accustomed accustomed to honest labor and had sense enough to feel that there was more true. They had sense enough to feel that there was more true enjoyment in living at peace and doing good to one's neighbor than in striking at him with a two-edged sword. It may not be too mu it may not be too much to hope that the rest of mankind will by and by grow as wise and peaceable as these five earth begrimed warriors who sprang from the dragon's teeth. And now the city was built, and there was a home in it for each of the workmen. But the palace of Cadmus was not yet erected, because they had left it till the last, meaning to introduce all the new improvements of architecture and make it very commodious as well as stately and beautiful. After finishing the rest of their labors, they all went to bed betimes in order to rise in the gray of the morning and get at least the foundation of the edifice laid before nightfall. But when Cadmus arose and took his way and took his way towards the site where the palace was to be built, followed by his five sturdy workmen marching all in a row, what do you think he saw? What should it be but the most magnificent palace that had ever been seen in the world? It was built of marble and other beautiful kinds of stone, and rose high into the air with a splendid dome and a portico along the front and carved pillars and everything else that befitted the habitation of a mighty king. It had grown up out of the earth in almost as short a time as it had taken the armed host to spring from the dragon's teeth. And what made the matter more strange, no seed of the stately edifice had ever been planted. When the five workmen beheld the dome, with the morning sunshine making it look golden and glorious, they gave a great shout. Long live King, long live King Cadmus, they cried, in his beautiful palace. And the new king, with his five faithful followers at his heels, shouldering their pickaxes and marching in a rank, for they still had a soldier-like sort of behavior, as their nature was, ascended the palace steps. Halting at the entrance, they gazed through a long vis vista of lofty pillars that were ranged from end to end of a great hall. At the farther extremi extremity of this hall, approaching slowly towards him, Cadmus beheld a female figure, wonderfully beautiful, and adorned with a royal robe and a crown of diamonds over her golden ringlets and the richest necklace that ever a queen wore. His heart thrilled with delight. He fancied it his long-lost sister Europa, now grown to womanhood, coming to make him happy and to repay him with her sweet sisterly affection for all those weary wanderings in quest of her since, of her since he left King Agnor's palace, for the tears that he had shed on parting with Phoenix and Celix and Thassus, for the heartbreakings that had made the whole world seem dismal to him over his dear mother's grave. But, as Cadmus advanced to meet the beautiful stranger, he saw that her features were unknown to him, although, in the, in the little time that it required to tread along the hall, he had already felt a sympathy betwixt himself and her. No, Cadmus, said the same voice that had spoken to him in the field of the armed men, this is not that dear sister Europa, whom you have sought so faithfully all over the wide world. This is Harmonia, a daughter of the sky, who has given you instead of sister, and brothers, and friend, and mother. You will find all those dear ones in her alone. So King Cadmus dwelt in the palace with his new friend Harmonia, and found a great deal of comfort in his magnificent abode, but would doubtless have found as much, if not more, in the humblest cottage by the wayside. Before many years went by, there was a group of rosy little children, but how they came thither has always been a mystery to me, sporting in the great hall and on the marble steps of the palace, and running joyfully to meet King Cadmus when the affairs of state left him at leisure to play with them. They called him father and Queen Harmonia mother. The five old soldiers of the dragon's teeth grew very fond of these small urchins and were never weary of showing them how to shoulder sticks, flourish wooden swords, and march in military order, blowing a penny trumpet or beating an abominable rub-a-dub upon the, a little drum. 
but King Cadmus, lest there should be too much of the dragon's tooth in his children's disposition, used to find used to find time from his kingly duties to teach them their ABC, which he invented for their benefit, and for which many little people, I am afraid, are not half so grateful to him as they ought to be. And that is the end of The Dragon's Teeth by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I hope that you will continue to join me for more myths from many lands in the future. Thank you, and I hope that you have a great day.